Now, we live in a world where everyone, everyone, with very few exceptions, believes that governments have to fund science. And the argument is very simple. Science is a public good. You produce a piece of research, and others can capture that research at much less cost to themselves than it costs you to make it. Therefore, by doing research, you actually preferentially empower your competitors. If it costs you £100 to do a piece of research, then you're £100 poorer for it. If your competitors can pick this piece of research up for only, say, £10, cost of buying the journal, then they are as informed as you, but they have £90 to spare on investment in the next stage of the development of the product, and therefore you'll get bust. And therefore, markets punish research. Standard economic theory, taught everywhere. It's called post neoclassical endogenous growth theory today because Paul Romer, a friend of yours, um, has uh, put this in terms of uh, neoliberal, neoclassical economics. But it simply says, as I've described, that markets do not supply public goods. Okay, I'll tell you what I'll do. Rather than get, get into that argument, forget I said it, forget I said that, and let's just talk about the substantive matters. I'm very happy to over a pint. No, 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 it's great. We had a great conversation at dinner. So forget, I shouldn't have said that. I've just given you the straight argument, public goods, it's cheaper here. Okay. Universally accepted. Um, um, I, I don't, I'm not aware of anyone in the whole world who agrees with me when I say it's not true. <laughs> Unfortunately, though, the problem with the theory is that every empirical fact disproves it. It's just that people ignore the empirical fact and simply assume the theory must somehow be true. So, let's have a look at some facts. Uh, America is a very interesting example of this. The Americans, traditionally and historically, simply did not believe that governments would fund science. They didn't know it was meant to be a public good in their ignorance until 1940, and whenever anyone tried to fund it, they just found that the government wouldn't fund it. So, for example, you all have heard of the Smithsonian Institution in America. The Smithsonian Institution was created by a man called Smithson, who was the illegitimate son of the Duke of Northumberland, an Englishman, and he was so bitter by the way he was treated here in England, they left all his money in the 1840s to the States to build an institution to be named after him that would outlive the memory of the Percy's. He, would, he absolutely was cross with his illegitimate father, so to speak, and would be dedicated to science research in his memory in perpetuity. Uh, the problem with this, the American government didn't believe in the funding of science, even if the money was given by other people, and the money was sent to a bank in Arkansas, where it stayed for about 13 years. And after 13 years, it slowly dawned on the American government that the money was being stolen by local politicians in Arkansas, so they took the remaining money back and created the Smithsonian. But that's how reluctant the Americans were to fund science. And the interesting thing is that the American government decided to fund science in 1940 to coincide with the Second World War, and this continued, of course, into the Cold War. And now the American government is one of the world's largest funders of science, in fact, the largest funder, the single largest funder of science. You also have economic data going back to the 1820s to the current day. And economic data is very, very clear. American GDP per capita has grown at 2% a year, year in, year out, smoothed out over 10-year periods since 1820. We've now nearly had 200 years of economic growth in America, linear. And what happened after 1940 when the American government started to fund science? Nothing. Underlying rates of economic growth, underlying rates of total factor productivity, completely unchanged. It's exactly the same story in Britain. We had an industrial revolution, we created the world's largest richest economy. There was no government funding for science in this country of any significance whatsoever, just the odd penny here and there, until 1913, when the Medical Research Council was created. And of course, the big force behind the Medical Research Council was the current fear that people had about eugenics. Eugenics, of course, being the concern that the quality of the human race was deteriorating because we were allowing the lower classes and black people and other undesirables to breed and therefore we had to do what H.G. Wells and Bernard Shaw told us we had to do, which is to find painless ways of killing these people. Ideas that were in fact taken up, as we all now know, by Adolf Hitler. But it wasn't a really great reason for funding science in this country, the Medical Research Council. And since then we've had an enormous amount of government funding for science in this country, and underlying rates of total factor productivity and economic growth 
no impact. Most fascinating of all, in 2003, the OECD published a complex longitudinal multivariate analysis, which you can get on the web, and it's called The Sources of Economic Growth in OECD Countries, 2003. And they look at all the OECD countries over a 25-year period, and they look at anything you can think of measuring, they look at, and then see how all these impacted on the 20 or so OECD countries over that 20-plus year period of time. And what the OECD reported, all, of, all this, by the way, is in this very good book called Sex, Arts and Profits. Um, what they reported was that there was a correlation between the amount of money a country spent on R&D, research and development, which is a broader thing than science. Science is sort of what happens in universities. R&D is the bigger thing that happens in companies as well as universities. And there was a direct correlation between the amount of money a country spent on R&D and subsequent rates of economic growth but only between the private funding of R&D and economic growth. There was no correlation between public funding and economic growth. Even worse, there was crowding out. Every time a government spent a pound, a dollar or a euro on R&D, the private sector in that country spent 1.25 pounds or dollars or euros less. So the government funding of R&D not only has no positive impact on economic growth, but by crowding out the private R&D, actually damages economic growth. And that is the OECD, which didn't know how to explain its own data, was intensely embarrassed by its own data, and is very pleased with the fact that everyone has kindly ignored it ever since, because it was too upsetting. Three people have said this, I was, he, he says modestly, the first to point out that OECD data showed that the government funding of R&D simply crowded out private funding disproportionately. There's another economist showed the next year that, actually, in Washington, D.C. I can't remember his name, but it's in here. No one's ever referred to his papers. And then the OECD's huge study, which no one has ever referred to. So we have an extraordinary situation where all empirical evidence, I don't mean anecdotal, you can always come up with anecdotes. You know, if this government hadn't done that, we wouldn't have this. But... No systematic economic historical data supports the suggestion that science is actually public good that requires public funding. And if you look at America until 1940, it had become the richest country in the world by 1890, which is 50 years before, and had invented things like the aeroplane and Edison and all the stuff that you know, the Americans are famous for by 1940. As I said, they've been the richest country in the world for 50 years, i.e. the most technologically advanced country in the world for 50 years, without government funding science. On the other hand, you have countries like the Soviet Union, or India, or China, which have enjoyed enormous government funding for science, and also enjoyed huge poverty. Um, I remember once, I didn't know her at all well, so this is name dropping, it's just a true story. I was once in the 80s asked to go and brief Margaret Thatcher when she was Prime Minister uh, on various things, and on the government funding of science, and she said to me, she said, what this country needs, she said, are more Nobel Prizes in science. And I said, oh, you mean like the Soviet Union? <laughs> and she said, don't just see me. <laughs> and that's really how deep the conversation generally is. So why is this? Why is it, just to come back to the nature of science, that it doesn't seem to behave as a public good? Well, actually, just think, just for a second, about how difficult it is really to access science that isn't, isn't your own. Let's forget contemporary science. Let's go to really, really old science. Science is 100 years old, you know, back in the dark ages when it was pretty simple and straightforward. Let's look at uh, Einstein's theories of relativity. Now those papers now are 100 years old. I mean, we're talking about really primitive science. How many people in this room could understand those papers? Oh, you can. Bits and pieces. Sorry? He wasn't, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you can. But I think you'll agree that it's not that really available to most people. Absolutely not. And I, I'm afraid it's the same with all bits of science and technology. Actually, it's impenetrable except to people who are in very closely related fields. 
so closely related that an economist called Mansfield actually did the maths. He said he took 100 companies in the New England states in the 80s and he looked at a large number of innovations that had gone from one com company to another. So company A had invented something and he calculated the costs to company B of copying it. The real costs. How much did it actually cost? And the costs were 65%. So competitor companies cost them 65% to copy an innovation that it cost the first company to do the research. But that's just the direct marginal costs. On top of that, the competitor company needs to have invested the sunk costs in employing the scientists and technologists and researchers and engineering facilities and labs in the first place. And on top of that, it had to equip those scientists with, the, with um, budgets so they can go to conferences, budgets so they can actually read journals and subscribe to journals, and indeed with their own research projects. Because if you're not doing research in that field, you simply cannot acquire the information of another paper because you're not actually equipped to read that paper. Because much of the knowledge is, of course, tacit knowledge. Add the direct marginal, add the, the direct marginal cost of acquiring an innovation from a competitor company, which is mainly the tacit knowledge of just rediscovering with your own hands, literally how it works, to the sunk costs of employing the scientists in the first place and the research projects they have to do so they can understand the field, and the cost of copying, not surprisingly, work out as 100%, because that's the equilibrium position you'd expect, actually, in an economy. You'd expect an economy to titrate itself such that the cost of copying would be the same as the costs of innovation, because otherwise no one would innovate. And to use a circular argument, Companies spend a great deal of money on innovation. Up to 3% of GDP, actually, are spent by advanced economies on R&D. And if the government doesn't spend any money, say, in Japan or Switzerland, where it doesn't, then 3% of GDP is being spent by companies solely to do R&D. So we know, therefore, with this huge private funding of R&D, that in equilibrium, the cost of copying and the cost of innovation must equilibrate, because otherwise you wouldn't be in equilibrium and your economy wouldn't have settled at that figure. So it is in fact a complete myth that science and R&D are publicly available, freely available. There is no evidence that it's so, and all the evidence is that it's not. So, why do people believe the story and the theory? Why is it that however many times you try to dispute it, you are laughed out of court? Well, first of all, of course, there's always anecdote. You know, where would we be without the World Wide Web, invented by Tim Berners-Lee at CERN? Government-funded project gave us the web. Clearly, without the government, we would still be using quill pens and vellum, and we just wouldn't have the advantage of the web. Now, this is an argument that's very hard, unless you're... You know, but let us actually consider another case in point, because I'm going to come straight back to Tim Berners-Lee and the web and CERN. Think of the aeroplane. Now the aeroplane, as we all know, was invented by the Wright brothers in 1903. And they spent $1,000 of their own money, and they flew kitty, they flew um, uh, uh, aeroplane one, whatever it's called, in, uh, in Kitty Hawk in Carolina, wherever it was, and they discovered the aeroplane. At the same time, there was a research project, funnily enough, conducted by the Smithsonian Institution, funded by the government, the American government, to the tune, then a lot of money, of $47,000, which was then increased, so it became about $63,000. And the reason for this, by the way, was the Spanish-American War. The Smithsonian Institution had gone to the Washington and said, you've got all these bad people in Cuba that you're quite rightly trying to kill, in preparation to the Iraq War, I expect, um, and you could kill them so much more effectively if you bombed from the air, so why don't we invent you an airplane? The American Congress thought this was an extremely enlightened argument and gave the Smithsonian $67,000 in order to invent the aeroplane. As it turned out, the Wright brothers did it first. Imagine, though, if the Wright brothers hadn't. Imagine that the Smithsonian had actually got there first. And it was a race, by the way. The Smithsonian may never have flown their aeroplane because every time they tried to fly it, it, it crashed. But you could imagine that they might have flown an aeroplane. They were stupid. We'd all go around saying, well, but for the American government, we'd all still be in horses and buggies. Only the beneficent and genius of the American government has given us the aeroplane. Where would we be without the American government? 
But we have actually the experiment because we know the Wright brothers got there first. But no one ever goes around saying the one thing we mustn't do is fund governments fund science because that crowds out the Wright brothers. For some reason that argument is never legitimate. And so the Wright brothers inventing the airplane independently of the state is somehow discounted as a historical accident. But when Tim Berners-Lee at CERN does it, oh well, we wouldn't be without it. Just to come back to CERN and Tim Berners-Lee, um, it is absolutely true that he made a fantastic observation. He came up with a very nice algorithm. And, but the reason he did it was the, what was then called, we don't use this language anymore, what we then called distributed computer, or distributing computing, was a technology whose time was undoubtedly coming. And the bigger the activities you were engaged in, such as CERN, the more likely you were eventually to make the breakthrough that you needed for distributed computing. What you have to do is ask yourself, CERN is an exceptionally expensive project, costing billions, and you have to work out, and it's a complicated equation that can be done, what would have happened if we hadn't funded CERN? But a, that money would have been back in the economy, so there would have been you know, productive use of that economy, because we know that only privately funded R&D actually translates into economic growth. And therefore, you would have to assume that Berners-Lee would have actually been employed by Unilever or ICI and would have made his discovery in a related but similar, if, if suddenly, technically different context. What happens with history on the government funding of science is totally anecdotal. All of American productivity and creativity before 1940 was produced by the private sector. No one ever says it's extraordinary. Thank God the private sector produces all this R&D. But since 1940, governments have moved into R&D, displaced the private sector for R&D. Underlying rates of economic growth have not increased. Underlying rates of total activity productivity have not increased. But obviously discoveries have been made. And everyone says, well, without the government, it wouldn't have been made. It's a, it's a non sequitur. And that is the text. And that is the context because people assume that science is a public good. And what this shows is the devastating power of ideas. And people are very, very bad at handling ideas. You tell people that science is a public good, and whatever the evidence is, it's a public good, as always. And therefore, and, and that is what you're up against when you're dealing with science. So, I could go on and on and on a lot, but rather than, I'm very happy to take questions and let that be the format for continuing, let me just say the following things. There is no systematic quantitative evidence looking at national performance and national budgets for science or R&D that the government funding of R&D does anything other than displace the private funding of R&D. There is no evidence that the public funding of R&D stimulates economic growth. There is a wealth of evidence that under the laissez-faire regime of America before 1940 or the laissez-faire regime in Britain before, 18, before 1913 when we created an entire industrial revolution without a penny of government funding that the private sector can more provide them, can do more, can provide more than it needs in terms of R&D. The idea, however, is extremely pervasive. No one believes this, though, in the case of, say, law. Everyone knows that the person who represents himself in court or herself in court has a fool for a lawyer. Everyone knows that. Only fools represent themselves in court. The law is a public good. There's nothing to stop you going to the college library here and reading the All England Law Reports. It's a public good. You can read these books and become just as good as any other lawyer. Like hell. And that's what science is like. It's an impenetrable, complex field, only open to those in very closely related fields after vast years of training. And even for them, it costs as much to make a copy as to make an innovation. Even amongst the cognoscenti, the cost of copying add up to the cost of innovation. It's just not a public good. It's not a private good, and that's the problem. It's not a private good. It is, to use the technical language, um, do people know the definition of public goods? Non, non rivalrous. You, you've heard all these stories. Technically, it is. It is not rivalrous. And uh, what's the other one? Non rivalrous and non excludable. non excludable. It's absolutely true. My understanding of how to operate this remote control is not in any way affected if you have the same understanding 
and I can't stop you acquiring that understanding. So to that extent, it's non-rivalrous and non-excludable. But in practice, it may potentially be non-rivalrous, but actually to access it costs as much as to have produced it in the first place, and so it behaves as a private good in practice. And in this book, I came up with a new concept. I'm not boasting, I'm just saying how I, how I, how I came around this problem, and I called it an invisible college good, by which I mean that science and practice is organised in invisible colleges. This is a term. I didn't forge that term. It's a term that's been around in the sociology of science for 50 years. But scientists form themselves in these invisible colleges because science, of course, in practice, is based on trust. Uh, science is just like the market, by the way. Um, if you want to... I mean, why do scientists publish? Why do scientists publish? I mean, if, if publishing is meant to be so bad, you know, why do you do it? Well, you publish actually because you want credibility and, and, and all the things that come from uh, being rewarded for what you've, you've done, including patents, by the way, have to be published. Everyone understands they have to be published. So scientists are publishing all the time. But in fact, the, peer, the, the, peer, the peers that review them, they have to know them personally. The reality is you can't, you can't review a paper of someone you don't actually know if you believe what they're saying. If, if, it's someone like, if, if you had a paper written by someone called Madoff, your instinct is that he's telling you an untruth and that you would, you would refuse the paper, even though it says, I have cured cancer. You think, I wonder if that's really true. But if a paper is written by someone called Albert Einstein and says, actually, space-time continuous bends in this particular way, you think, well, it's probably no, what he's talking about. And actually, that's what peer review in science is all about. It's structures based on trust, by which people who know each other personally or by reputation can foster grants and publications and all the rest of it. They're called invisible colleges, and they're completely separate from each other. Physicists talk to each other, biochemists talk to each other, they have nothing in common. And, and that's why I call it invisible college. And within the invisible college, science is indeed non-rivalrous, non-excludable. But the costs of, a, of accessing the non-rivalrous and non-excludable things are as high as discovering them, and by the time you have first mover advantage, either the person who makes the discovery first has a monopoly on that discovery until finally the competitors get there, um, shows that in fact the innovator has enough time to exploit his or her discovery before the competition gets there. But when the competition does get there and does copy, which they do eventually, it's a jolly good thing. The last thing you want is a series of monopolists. Science is almost perfect in the way it works. The inventor has a monopoly. This monopoly encourages him or her to exploit the discovery profitably. But with time, the monopoly is lost because the innately non-rivalrous and non-excludable nature of science means that eventually the competitors catch up, although it costs them a lot of money to get there. And when they do catch up, you're no longer in a monopoly and the society therefore benefits from the non-monopolistic nature of the science. And the time scales seem to work almost perfectly. If you really wanted proof of the existence of God, it's the perfect nature by which knowledge is distributed in a free market. Because only God could have got it just so perfectly right. Thank you very much. Now that was short, so we could have questions. Yeah, I, I have no problems with charitable donations. And Gates, of course, is in a long tradition. What's, what's very interesting is the rise and fall of private charities in science. Um, before the Second World War, when there was no government funding, you had huge private charities. You had the Carnegie Institution in America. You had, in this country, the Wellcome Trust. And the extent to which the private sector funded science charitably was absolutely astonishing. So, for example, it's very common to hear people say, well, of course, no government will ever fund CERN, you know. Well, the first cyclotron, CERN is a cyclotron, the first cyclotron was built by uh, Lawrence in San Francisco in the mid-40s, and it cost a million dollars, which was then a very large sum of money. And it was a purely defence initiative, it's so that he could get out his uranium enrichment to build an atom bomb. Uh, it was funded by the Carnegie Foundation for a million dollars. 
Because in those days, with science being primarily in the private sector, people felt a responsibility to society. Amazingly, in the First World War, when America joined the First World War, it created a National Science Foundation because it, under the leadership of Edison, funny enough, because uh, it needed to know how you built radar, whatever it is you needed in the First World War, machine guns, and I, I don't know what the technologies they needed in those days. The National Research Council, called the National Research Council, was largely funded by a series of charitable foundations, Carnegie and the rest. So there was the American government declaring war, going to war, and the American Army and Navy and whatever, Air Force, whatever, they don't have an Air Force, but Army and Navy saying, we need new technologies for these things. And instead of going to the Defense Department, they went to the private foundations. That's how private science was in America until very recently. So, if Bill Gates wants to spend his money with Melissa or Melinda, whatever she's called, on helping, that, that's just fantastic. And actually, that's what civil society does, and it should be applauded. But it doesn't need taxpayers' intervention. But can we... Uh, am I my own chairman? I don't mind being my own chairman. Look, there, there and there. Yeah, so. You know, you know, the story of eugenics is really interesting because eugenics was the global warming of the pre-war era. Everybody believed in eugenics. Everybody. And it had an apparently good... There's a fantastic book called Intellectuals and the Masses, which... The best description of eugenics, written by a, a, a Merton professor, John Carey or John Casey, Intellectuals and the Masses. And he just looks at what intellectuals between 1890 and 1940 thought about working class people. That's what it's about. And basically, intellectuals thought that working class people should sort of be gassed or something. That's what they thought. And they said it. Um, and the theory is very simple. Previous to about 1830, when the Industrial Revolution starts, poor people were always dying of starvation. So if you go to the first survey of British people in 1688, all, all, uh, it's all described here, um, the first survey done for the government in 1688, more than half of all people are actually dying of starvation. And what happens, they have four or five good years, and there's a bad year, and 10% of the population just dies. Four or five years, as a population is static. People are producing babies all the time, but the population is static. And then suddenly, bang, the population increases because the agricultural industrial revolution allow all these people to live. And you're living in your nice Kensington suburb, surrounded by acres, and then suddenly there are all these working class people living in slums all around you, and they're clearly polluting the atmosphere, and something should be done about them, so they should be sort of removed. And you justify this because, obviously, under natural selection, they're meant to have died, and it's only the artificial food of the agricultural industrial revolution that allows these deformed subhuman filth to breed and take away your nice vistas. So, the science is there, natural selection. The explanation is there, the shocking business of technology that feeds these people. And the consequences are obvious. There are all these frightful members of the working classes all over the place. Therefore, you have to do what H.G. Wells and Bellish and all the others said. You have to help natural selection on its way. And you have to put down the mentally defective and working class women and all the other problems of society. Universally believed, by the left especially. And the quotations, and they're in here, but they come out of intellectuals and the masses, are truly appalling. It is very hard to believe people like H.G. Wells saying, well, we have to exterminate the working classes, but it must be done kindly. <laughs> and it's very hard to read these things. And of course, all that Adolf did was to take what was in the zeitgeist and just put it into practice. Now, I look at global warming. I genuinely don't know, is the answer. I don't know if anyone really knows. The science is there, you know, the greenhouse effect, it could well be true, just as natural selection is, is true to some extent. But whether feeding the poor actually reduces the quality of the genome, I suspect, is not true. Um, but, but, there seems to be this huge millennial need that people have, that there's some catastrophe that's imminent that can only be resolved by collective scientific 
effort. It was eugenics, it's now global warming. If you read Skeptical Environmentalists by Bjorn Lomborg and books like that, he shows pretty clearly that contrary to the paradigm, it's the rich countries that have least pollution and the poor countries that have most pollution. But of course, CO2 is the traditional paradigm because of course rich countries produce CO2. What I do know is that no one really knows. I mean, everyone knows the temperatures have been stationary since the year 2000. What makes me think it's all rubbish is the selective data that's put out. Everyone knows that the Arctic ice cap is shrinking. Everyone knows this because we're told on a daily basis. No one is told that the Antarctic ice cap is expanding. No one tells you this. So when you give selective information, one has a very strong suspicion. And the trouble with scientists is this, and again I went into that in this book because scientists are very interesting people. It's a myth that scientists are popperians. The popperian myth is that scientists put theories up and then spend all their time trying to disprove their theories because all they're interested in is truth. They are not falsifiers. Scientists are verifiers. They're advocates. They have a belief which they form for all sorts of complicated reasons, like, um, uh, for example, the belief that the Earth was not at the center of the universe, but the Sun was the center of the universe, the Copernicus story that we all know about. It didn't come about because Copernicus had actually better observations than Tycho Brahe. It came about because Copernicus felt that God liked things elegant. And all these epicycles, which you have to have, all these funny epicycles, if you have the Earth at the center of the universe, they just didn't look pretty to Copernicus. But if you have the sun in the centre, they're just sweeping around in these lovely circles, Kepler later told us they were ellipses, it just looked better. And he just felt intuitively that God, understanding um, interior design, and <laughs> would have had it that way. And so what happens is that, although the observations that Tycho Brahe made were actually better than his... So ultimately science comes down to these intuitive beliefs of how you think the world really is, and you set out to verify your beliefs. And science can progress only by this way, actually. I mean, give you another example. The fascinating argument over the age of the Earth in the 19th century. In the 19th century, there were those who followed the geologists who pointed out that the rate of sedimentary rock production and all the fossils in the rocks and all the rest of it meant that the Earth must be millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of years old. However, there was another group of geologists who measured the temperature of the Earth, and it's quite hot down there, and they worked out the rate of cooling, and worked out that even if the Earth had started off at the temperature of the Sun, it could only be about five or six million years old, because it would have cooled completely otherwise. So you have two groups of scientists in the 19th century. No one ever tells you these stories because science is always presented as a sort of simple progress. But in the 19th century, there was this real division of two groups of geologists. The earth-cooling geologists who proved, and they had proved, by the way, that the earth couldn't be more than five or six million years old. And the sedimentary geologists who proved that the earth had to be hundreds of millions of years old. And the way they resolved this problem is they went to different societies and talked to different groups of people because they couldn't bear each other's company because they couldn't understand how to proceed. And science can only proceed on that basis, otherwise you get paralysed with indecision and doubt. It'd be like being a liberal democrat. If you tried to accommodate <laughs> both sets of theories simultaneously, it couldn't be done. And does anyone here know how that dilemma was resolved? Anyone there? No. someone discovered radioactivity. And someone then discovered that radioactivity produced heat. And the centre of the globe, the Earth, of course, is radio it's not very radioactive, but it's radioactive, which produces heat. So the Earth is continually warming. So both sets of scientists were right. But the point is, science is always groping in the dark. All, all scientists always know. It's very exciting being scientists, because you know you don't know what you're doing. It's, it's, it's actually a very exciting experience making these discoveries. So all scientists knew they didn't really know what's going on. And they understand. I mean, we scientists understand each other. We all know we're verifiers. And we all know the last thing we actually want is to be falsified. <laughs> and so that's how science works. And these little invisible college all, all try to ignore each other until they can resolve their differences. So is it easy for someone for this state to come in or someone with the agenda to come in and like push this or Because it doesn't look like the two, both warming or no-warming is equal to me, but there's only one we're hearing about it. Because, you know, if there's a uh, carbon trading, So, it, it, yeah, so it, it basically I just think the state is dangerous for science, basically, because it, it pushes certain agendas. Yeah. Yeah.
the, the scientists push it. I think there's a very important human force out there. People feel a very strong need to signal to each other that they're good people. Um, and different societies have different ways of doing this. So um, in medieval times, people went to church and burned each other as a way of showing that they were good people because they believed in the doctrines of our Saviour. Um, in the 19th century, people showed they were good people by being socialists. That, that meant that you were a good person. You didn't actually have to do anything like actually give your money away or anything like that, but you had to say you were a socialist. And, um, and that meant that you were a good person. And unfortunately, that one sort of doesn't work very well anymore. And I think there's a real need for people to find something that they can put as a badge. You know, people, you know, George W. Bush went around with a little pearl, didn't he? I'm a torturer. You know, that's, that's how he showed he was a good person, because by his torture he was saving the American people from Al-Qaeda outrages. So people have a, they, they want to signal, literally, that they're good people. And I think global warming fills a, fills a very important need. You know, I'm a really good person. I'm worried about the globe. And the fact that facts might interfere with your... It really can be ignored. So scientists have understood this, and all that scientists are interested in, because we are hugely selfish people, is our own reputation. You know, am I going to win a Nobel Prize? Am I going to be a fellow of the Royal Society? Am I going to get the Regis Chair of Physics at Christchurch? Well, you do that by publishing the best science around. And if, and for that, that needs money. Science is very dependent upon money. I mean, wholly dependent upon money. And if there's money in global warming, my goodness me, that's what you're rightly wrong about. So you should be very cynical about scientists, because they are actually very cynical people. They're not worse than other people, but they're certainly not better. <laughs> Um, I thought it was interesting you were saying how uh, in the First World War the uh, sorry, I'm just changing the subject a little bit. Um, how uh, when the US government went to the private charities and uh, well the foundations, I, I imagine that's how the defense industry started <laughs> with uh, by the government providing <laughs> large amounts of money to the private sector. Um, I wanted to ask how you think trade, uh, trademarks and patents fit in. Oh, this. I have a whole chapter. I have a whole chapter dedicated uh, to because, this. I mean, certainly government intervention. Yeah. Into the yeah, right, thank you. It's a really good question. I have a whole chapter, and I'll give you a clue as to my thoughts. The chapter is entitled "Let's Abolish Patents." <laughs> <laughs> they are wholly illegitimate. Um, they're just a monopoly. The thing, you know, Marx got this right. Capitalists do not seek to open markets; they seek to close them. Capitalists are dreadful people, as the bankers have shown. They are interested solely in personal profit. Nothing wrong in that. But what society has to do is to listen to them with extreme circumspection. Now, what capitalists say about patents or patents, no one knows how you pronounce that word, is this. If I didn't have a patent, and I wasn't able to maintain my monopoly on my discovery, I wouldn't make any discoveries because I couldn't preserve my monopoly. Because as everyone knows, science is a public good, and the moment I make a discovery, everyone will immediately copy me. Well, A, we know that science isn't a public good, actually. And let me tell you a story before I explain my theories. A very interesting story. In 1903, the Wright brothers created Flyer One, and they went buzzing around the place of Flyer One. Flyer One, at one, some point, became redundant and was put in a museum. Would anyone like to guess which museum Flyer One has spent most of its life in? Anyone seen Flyer One? That's exactly right. Today, the, Smith the Flyer One is in the Smithsonian. But it didn't go there first. It spent most of its life in another museum. Would anyone like to guess? Flyer One has spent most of its life in the British Museum in London. And if you go to the Smithsonian and try to find this fact, it's very hard to discover this fact. They don't exactly blazon it. But it is, in fact, if you go to it, next time you're in Washington, go and look at it. It's in the, uh, it's exactly to describe, but it's there, it's a fantastic site. And there's a plaque on the side. And if you look really carefully to the side, there's a tiny little letters. They do actually tell you that Flyer One was in the British Museum in London. Now, why is this? I'll tell you why. The Wright brothers invented Flyer One. Unfortunately for them, the world was full of people who thought that flying airplanes was a very interesting thing to do and started to copy them. 
And the Wright brothers had patented the aeroplane. They, they were brilliant. They patented the, he- the propeller, they patented the aerolongs, they patented uh, the wing shapes. I mean, I don't know about aeroplanes, but they patented everything. And the result was, any time anyone else tried to fly an aeroplane, they absolutely, this is absolutely true, broke the Wright brothers' patents. And so the Wright brothers imposed their patents in American courts assiduously. And they very quickly stopped flying airplanes and they they became full-time professional lawyers. The result was that no one flew airplanes in America. Because every time they flew an airplane, the Wright brothers slapped them down. Even when the American government tried to create an air force, they were slapped down. The British and the French and the Germans were much more sensible than the Americans. They simply paid the Wright brothers' license fees, which is why we had a Luftwaffe and Spitfires and whatever it is you have in those days. But the American government wouldn't pay the license fees because they'd given their £67,000 to the Smithsonian and they just couldn't believe they hadn't funded the aeroplane. So by 1917, when the Americans went to war, there was no American air fighting capacity. The British and the French and the Germans had all these fantastic triplanes and, you know, killing each other. And the Americans, they were were still flapping their wings. And the first thing that happened in America in 1917, on the declaration of war, the American government abolished all patents in aeroplanes. And they said, in the national interest, and there's some libertarians in this room who are menaces and they believe in that sort of thing, in the national interest... There will be a patent pool. So you can publish your patent and we'll respect your property except for the fact that no one has to pay license fees. <laughs> it's called a patent pool. And people, because people get into sort of habits, they continue patenting. <laughs> for which other people were extremely grateful because they wrote down exactly how to copy each other. <laughs> it's a very bizarre story. And they just carried on doing this. Until 1975. Now, by 1975, which country had the dominating air industry in the world? America, obviously, and Boeing and all the rest. All without patent protection. Funnily enough, in 1975, Richard Nixon, who really was a dogmatic, unpleasant man, and of course had been captured by various producer interests in the American aeroplane industry, who thought they could make more money if they could actually preserve their patent rights, persuaded him to change the argument and and patents were reintroduced under Richard Nixon about the same time as the Watergate scandal in 1975. But between 1917 and 1975, no patents in America are the best American. So, what that showed is that the arguments are false. Then when the Americans had patent protection for the aeroplane industry in America, they had no American, American industry. When they abolished patent protection, it took off. Why? Patents are a totally illegitimate piece of property rights. They're based on the analogy, of course, of material property rights, which, of course, are the only way you can preserve investment in physical capital. Ideas, however, are non excludable non rivals, actually. So there is actually an innate conflict. This is non rivalrous and non excludable. Giving a man or woman property rights in it is natural. It goes with, sorry, it's rivalrous and excludable. It goes with the innate nature of the object. Ideas are not, so actually patents conflict with that. But it's actually based on a false economic idea. And the false economic idea is that you won't invest in ideas unless you can preserve the monopoly. Because actually the, the, the converse is true. If you can preserve your ideas in the monopoly and the patent, then actually you have a monopoly. And there's no incentive on your part to do any more research because you have a monopoly. And there's no incentive on anyone else's part to do research because they can't break your monopoly because you've got it. So patents are designed. Why do people lobby for patents? They lobby for patents because they're trying to keep the competition away. The whole point of patents is to stop the field from developing. You've made a discovery. You don't want anyone else to make it. You want to stop the field from growing the way the Wright brothers did. There's no empirical evidence at all that patents help. And it didn't go the other way around. Imagine, imagine, just think about the argument. Look, without patent protection, I won't do R&D. Great, go do R&D. Someone else will do R&D and take your industry away from you. Oh, well, you might do R&D then, mightn't you? There is very huge evidence that the greatest single cause of R&D is competition. The more competitive the industry, 
the more R&D people do. And the evidence is overwhelming. I mean, every study shows the more competitive an industry, the more people there are in an industry competing for the market, the more R&D they do. So patents should be utterly abolished. They are wicked and evil because bankers, as we all know, and, and people of their ilk, including ministers in Parliament with their expenses, they're all just out for themselves. And they'll say and do anything it takes to personally profit themselves. Patents are a fake. <laughs> Yeah. Do you think that the might be an argument in saying that the, the um, investment by the public sector and the private sector are more qualitatively different things? So, I mean, I, I, I do not say that I couldn't imagine sort of any company doing the necessary, you know, funding the necessary research in number theory to get to a point where it's been, you know, 100 years after the, the subject really taken off. Um, so, where you can have an LSA encryption and all those sorts of things. That's a very good argument, and there's on track. And, and it might have been true that, I mean, innately, you could have a world in which government funded only the purest of science, like number theory, or astronomy, say. Why should uh, British Leyland uh, invest in radio telescopes? Um, therefore, let the government fund the pure science that the market would otherwise neglect. Trouble with that argument is that it's not true empirically. First of all, it's been shown by a succession of economists that there's a direct correlation between the amount of money a company spends on pure science and its subsequent rate of profit making. I pure science, which is pursued solely for its own sake, without any thought of profit, turns out to be the most profitable investment a company can make. Why is that? Well, the answer is that the most important function of scientists in the company is not the production of original knowledge. Actually, no company, however big, is anything other than a tiny bit player on the whole global stage, and is never going to make the majority of discoveries it needs to make for itself, however hard it tries, because it, A, many discoveries come from left field anyway, and so number theory turns out unexpectedly to be very important if you're trying to make car tires in Alaska. And there's no way the car tire manufacturer knows that in advance. Uh, but secondly, your competitors are also doing research. And the main function of scientists in the company is to import the knowledge that's out there. And you're a manufacturer making car tires in Alaska and you discover suddenly that number theory is telling you actually how to do it. If you're not employing people who are intellectually equipped already to appreciate the importance of number theory when it becomes important to your company, you're never going to import that discovery. And you'll never make that unless you're actually employing pretty theoretical physicists or scientists or mathematicians in the first place. Because the most important function of scientists in the company is the import of other people's knowledge. So it turns out the more pure science you fund commercially, the more likely your company is to grow. And indeed, if you think of some of the most extraordinary discoveries, I mean, who, for example, discovered um, the background radiation from the Big Bang? Who, in fact, discovered uh, that, te that uh, stars produced radio waves? Both created Nobel Prizes and both done in Bell Telephone Labs by engineers employed by Bell Labs. They weren't consciously doing pure science, but science is such an unpredictable activity and these people who are trying to create radio telephony ended up making these extraordinary fundamental discoveries in physics. And it goes the other way as well. Silicon transistors that came out of Bell Labs and related labs, very pure scientists supplying their mind to a practical problem. So that then raises sort of another question, but surely no one but the government is going to fund the further development of radio telescopes. Okay, radio telescopes came accidentally out of industry. But why should industry continue to... Why, no, surely, the, surely no company would fund the Hubble telescope. Well, if you go back to the 19th century, when governments certainly didn't fund radio uh, astronomy, you have these huge 100-inch, 200-inch telescopes being built by millionaires like Bill Gates. Bill Gates is now this huge foundation of literally billions of dollars. I think, I think with Warren Buffett's money, that foundation is $35 billion or something. 
But it's now spending money on orphan drugs for malaria because that's an area that's universally neglected. But if Bill Gates lived in the world of 100 years ago, he'd be funding Hubble telescopes. Except he doesn't have to do it now because the government's doing it. And in those days, many more people funded Hubble telescopes or, the, or SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. I mean, the government used to fund that, and it withdrew from funding it because it thought it was silly. There were only green men out there. And now the American private sector raises six and a half million dollars every year to, to search with their radio telescopes for little green men. So the trouble is that in practice, the private sector does fund the purest of science. And in practice, the government's not interested in pure science because governments actually are surprisingly materialistic. And what they actually want to do is to stimulate economic growth because that translates into national power. And so the irony of the government funding the science is it's mainly delegated as a form of corporate welfare. That's what it actually is in practice. And there's a huge row in the British scientific community at the moment because all the MRC, SCRC grants all have to say at the bottom, the scientist has to say, and you must give me the science money, dear sweet government, because with this discovery I'll be able to create economic advantage for this company and that. So the government funding of university science in this country today is totally distorted by the needs of commerce, in a stupid way it doesn't actually work, while at the same time commerce is funding the purest of pure science, because that's the only way you can keep up with the discoveries you need to make. So it's a nice idea that in practice doesn't work. I'm just going to say, as someone who's had experience of seeing these proposals, it's entirely right, you do have to write down what economic benefits you're immediately going to have by having this proposal. It's the rule. It's a silly rule. I mean, imagine Albert Einstein, 100 years ago, going to his bar in Berlin and having his beer and coming up with theories, and the, the public is saying, like, I'm sorry, I'm not giving you a beer, Mr. Einstein, unless you can prove that your theories are going to have economic benefit. I mean, what a lot of nonsense. I mean, the government gets it wrong every time. And never forget public choice theory. Governments love funding science. Do you remember Bill Clinton and Blair standing there when the human genome had been sequenced, taking all the personal glory. There were some scientists in the background, but no one saw them. It was all Bill Clinton standing on the podium. And the irony was that the human genome sequence is largely privately funded, actually, by the Wellcome Trust, paradoxically. Didn't stop the politicians taking all the credit and all the glory. Well, it is nine o'clock. We are allowed to stop that. I wanted to ask um, a question earlier on was about the impact of private donors. I wanted to sort of relay that question I just asked. Do, do you think then that the role of private donors is sort of less mercenary in some sense than, than um, sorry, it, it would be a private donor in front of the theory or you know, whatever, so yeah. to mark that uh, Well, actually. I mean, I, I, mean, I mean original research as opposed to this important. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Well, well Partly, actually, the commerce... I mean, if you look at the 19th century and all the, all the universities were independent until the war caused the nationalisation, but they're all independent in the 19th century, all doing perfectly <coughs> science. What happened is that the Industrial Revolution needed trained scientists and technologists, and they just needed them because otherwise they couldn't make their discoveries. So they had to go to university, these people, and university academics, of course, were no good unless they're doing research. So you actually get number theory being funded by industry indirectly in that people go to university to learn maths to become trained and get employment in merchant banks or wherever where mathematical skills are valued and the people who train them in the universities or educate them demand a significant amount of time for science for, for research so that comes out of the fee the student pays so if you can imagine a world in which there was no government funding for universities at all like in the 19th century and, you, and, and yet Finances needed mathematically skilled people to join the banks, which they did, then people would go to university to study accountancy or finance or maths, and the fees would be such that the individuals teaching them, the professors, would actually have time for research. So you do get, but the, but the other side of it, of course, is yes, you get rich donors funding pure science, largely for philanthropic motives, obviously they want to put their name on the telescopes or whatever, and it works under a free market you get enormous wealth secured by very rich people. That's what happens in free markets. And these people have psychological needs to be recognised, have psychological needs to be seen to be good. And in the free market, when there's no government funding there, they fund science. Astronomy, I mean, for example, take, take manned spaceflight. There was a wonderful man called Mooney Goddard, using Carnegie and other monies, 
He was the man who developed the early uh, space rockets. He was the one who got the gyroscope so that the rocket wouldn't fall over. He was the man who invented all the liquid fuels so that the rocket would move up into the sky. All this was done in Massachusetts, Wesley College, by Moon Goddard. And the only reason he didn't create the first Sputnik, which was done by the Russians, of course, the first artificial satellite, was unfortunately the war broke out, and he was then taken away from his space science and asked to invent the bazooka, which he did. So he invented the bazooka, which killed lots of people, and I'm sure that made lots of people happy. But but for the bazooka, but for the war, he, totally private sector, philanthropic research, would have had the first artificial satellite. And indeed, the first thing NASA did when they was created was to buy up all his patents from Mrs. Goddard. And she charged, and they paid, a million dollars. That's how much his work was worth. His work was worth to NASA when NASA finally took over. So we would have had no... And of course, once you have a satellite, you then immediately have the private sector. The poor profit comes in because people want radio telescopes. Or, you know, satellites and radios, you know, sat-navs and all that. The market then takes over in that particular example. So in fact, if there hadn't been a penny of NASA government funding for science, um, we would have had artificial satellites with the whole bunch of them. But that would, the initial investment in that case would have come from the philanthropic sector, in that case. But it often works the other way around. It was the for-profit sector that discovered radio telescopes, radio astronomy. Um, so the two sectors reinforce each other. But there's no evidence that the government funding does anything to help this, this thing at all. Um, I, just, I just wondered if you could say something about um, you, you, you know, a private university. Independent. Independent. So They're all private. Ox is private. Uh, independent. Yeah. I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit about how that works. Well, with great difficulty in Britain, um, if anyone ever asks, offers you a job as vice chancellor of an independent university, my advice is to turn it down. <laughs> <laughs> there's only one, and there's a reason why there's only one. And we're very small, we only have a thousand students, I mean, with the size of Christchurch. I don't know how students are in Christchurch, but. Well, Christchurch is Okay, well, Christchurch and St John's together, and that's my university. So we're very, very small. Um, the successful models are the American models, the Ivy League or the liberal arts colleges, and they're based on endowments, of course, that's how they work in. But we have to do it through, largely through student fees. And for us, it's very difficult because why pay to come to Buckingham, 8,000 a year or whatever, when you can come to Oxford at 3,000 a year? You know, we are hugely undercut and crowded out. Um, why come to Buckingham, therefore, when it's so much more expensive? Well, interestingly, if you look at output measures such as the National Student Survey of Student Satisfaction, Buckingham comes top every year. We beat every university, including Oxford, for student satisfaction. We beat Oxford for staff student ratios. We beat Oxford for contact time with students. They're actually better as a teaching institution than Oxford, which isn't surprising. Uh, the average American liberal art college is as well, by the way. It's not difficult beating Oxford as a teaching institution. Actually, if you look at the free market elsewhere, it's just that in this country, people aren't used to making that comparison. But crowding out is a real phenomenon. Consider the world of motor cars. Imagine you lived in a world where every household got a free car from the government every five years. Free. Taxes go up, of course, to pay for your free cars. But every five years, a free car arrives at your family's doorstep. Now, what would happen to the for-profit car manufacturer sector? It would go in decline. The, gov the government factories are supplying free cars. Who's going to go buy a second or third car? Obviously, some people would. But the private sector would be hugely reduced in size. Even more interestingly, the quality of cars would collapse. If you're paying your own money for a car, it's got to be a damn good car. But if you're getting a free car from the government every five years, you put up with the Trabant because it's free. And you think, well, thank God it's free. You know, what else do you expect? You know, the wheels are square. And, but at least it's free. And so crowding out is a very real phenomenon that people buy into because it, it's like MPs' expenses. It's like bankers' bonuses. Free cars or free science or whatever feeds into an aspect of human greed that's not very difficult to, under, to understand. And it's the same with universities. Buckingham's a better university. As a, if you're a student, Buckingham's a better university than any other university. But there is no question Oxford and Cambridge are fantastic. So, you know, perhaps we're not better than Oxford and Cambridge. We're certainly equivalent in experience. But we're certainly miles better than the average 
even though I still don't know the name in here, I get sued. <laughs> but the others are free. And so, why come to Buckingham? Well, 60% of our students come from abroad, which actually is great, it makes them a very global atmosphere. But not everyone wants to go to university where 60% of students are not British. That's not a, that's, well actually, more than 60% are not British because home actually means European as well. So we're like the LSE, the vast majority of our students come from abroad. We're the small little country town. We haven't got the diamonds we need. So running Buckingham is, is very, very difficult. Um, but we have, we've been growing successfully in the last few years. Actually, it's the National Student Survey. Um, and that's why we're succeeding. But crowding out is a real phenomenon. And it's very interesting that we're the only independent university in Britain. I'm sure there's no market for another one. It's quite funny. I've, I've seen, for example, a car up in Egypt where there's state subsidised cars and there's tariffs on foreign cars. I never knew that. Yeah. I invented that idea. Yeah, well, I've seen that actually happen. It's actually a horrible experience. And uh, one, of my, one of my friends was in one of those cars and the wheels fell off. <laughs> <laughs> so, Thank you for that. Yeah, Thank you for that. <laughs> Took a long time to remember that one. I was just going to say that as uh, fees for um, the university do go up, then you're going to have an easier time. Because there will be a less of a crowding out there. If the fees go up to 7,000 and it's quite a end, but when there's 8,000, then. Is, this, is that why you're bobbing to a self interested motive? <laughs> 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 uh, the cats are certainly removed, of course. Well, I, I, I mean, I, I mean, I. I I feel very angry about what the government's done to universities. Um, when I was at Cambridge, I mean, the, I got very, very cross with what the research assessment exercise did to people like me. I'm going to talk about that now because that's a specialised thing. But um, I mean, if I was the vice chancellor of the University of Oxford, I'd be very cross if I couldn't charge the fee the market would bear. I mean, I, could, I don't mind the government saying to the vice chancellor of the University of Oxford, "Look, mate, you can charge the fee the market will bear as long as no one is excluded for lack of money." You're a pretty middle-class university at Oxford. I know you all think that you're members of the press working class and that you're all the daughters of mine workers, but actually, you, many of you are not, in fact. You've just forgotten this. <laughs> many of you are the sons and daughters of that uh, bankers, strangely. Um, so, um, I think that the government has a very important role in playing out in universities these days. I don't think it did before 1914, but the world has moved on. And I think the government has a very serious role in universities to support... What, what the Americans would call needs blind admissions. And I think no one should be refused the place at Oxford if they are intellectually equipped and they pass exams and all the rest of it. They should not be denied a place for lack of money. That would be a horror. And while we live in the world in which we live, I can appreciate the government has a responsibility to meet that need. But that doesn't mean that you can't charge at Oxford 20,000 a year, or whatever it is Harvard's charging, because you'll find an astonishing number of people can pay that. And those who can't, of course, should then be supported by the government, because it's giving you all this money anyway. But on the other hand, those who can afford the fees shouldn't be getting what they currently are, this huge government subsidy, because it's not fair. Why should, why should someone who'd been to Eton, or in my case, Charterhouse, where my mummy and daddy have been paying huge sums all my life, suddenly get a free education at university, or hugely subsidised? It's just not fair that the dustman is paying for the lawyer. So what happens at Oxford and Cambridge is a lack of economic freedom imposed on the university which makes it a worse experience. It's like the Trabant in, 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 in Egypt. Now if you look at the British universities, European universities and American universities, it's very interesting. In British, American, sorry, in British, European and Asian universities, the government spends about 1% of GDP on universities. In America, the state governments and all that pay about 1% of GDP on universities. It's the same percentage of GDP going from the public sector in these hugely different countries. The difference is there's no crowding out in America and another 1% of GDP comes in privately. Various mechanisms. Whereas in this country it's illegal. Oxford's not allowed to charge more than 3,000 a year. Parisian universities aren't allowed to charge anything. German universities are now being allowed to charge 300 euros or something. But they're not allowed to. So the crowding out is actually statutory. And what I say is we should go to the American model in broad and simple terms. 1% of GDP from the state to support poor people, which is a very important function, actually. I, please don't think I'm being facetious. I, it would, I would hate to live in a country where, you know, Jude the obscure type of thing, where poor people were sued in university. That's an outrage. So, of course, the government should put in 1% of GDP for universities, but you should allow the market 
to rip on top of that so you can get that other 1% from the private sector with the result the universities will be much, much better places. Just to come back on that, I, the, the, the point you made about Germany is quite interesting. I really, as an academic blog, I really do scrutiny on sabbatical in Germany. I think it's really interesting to see how Germany is very unfocused. I think it would be asked to pay 150 euros or whatever. <laughs> 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 but the thing I wanted to come back on about the, um, the um, <coughs> subsidising um, people who couldn't afford to go to university otherwise, is doesn't, doesn't that sort of um, perpetuate a model that might not be sort of wise in, in a free market, if you see what I mean? I mean, the more people go to university than would otherwise do so, that is necessary. That's a very fair question. I agree. The point that I get is that the traditional degree structure isn't necessarily the best one, but any government funding has to cater to it. That is a fair question. I have absolutely no doubt at all that the economic benefits of universities are currently hugely overblown. I have no doubt that most people could leave school at 18 and go to the workplace and equip themselves with whatever skills they need, and the economic damage would be zero. In fact, it could even go the other way. I'm sure universities often teach economically damaging ideas, such as you don't get up till, eight, you know, till, till midday and you only need to do two essays a week and, and you're evicting. You know. so, <laughs> so I'm sure universities... The trouble is... And, I, I, and therefore, I have no doubt that in an equilibrium, the numbers of people going to university... Could, we could get away with many fewer people going to university and the damage would be trivial. And the universities could revert to being larger than what they used to be, which is professional training schools for priests in the case of Oxford and Cambridge, um, doctors in the case of the ends of, uh, you know, medical schools in London, ends of court could do law and all the rest of it. The only problem with what you've said is that there is a non-economic function to universities, which is this social function, where it's seen as a privilege, and it is a huge privilege, and it does confer huge benefits to individuals. I mean, there's no doubt that someone who's gone to Oxford will make a group of friends that will help sustain that person if they choose to become a civil servant or work for Unilever. There are all these networks that have unexpected consequences and benefits that help individuals. And so it really comes down to, do you want to live in a society where the state doesn't involve itself and where philanthropists might have been crowded out because of the wars and published everyone? And therefore, it is genuinely unfair. On the other hand, it's economically efficient. Or are you prepared to put up with greater economic efficiency because actually it makes people feel that society is less unfair? And that's a value judgment which no one can resolve. The truth is that privately I'm on your side more than I have, in a sense, expressed. But I am also aware of... I mean, I'm a pretty much an economic functionist, really. I, I'm very reluctant, actually, to interfere with free markets and things. But... You know, in the final analysis, I would hate, I would hate, I remember when I, I, I trained in medicine first, and I decided I really wanted to be a biochemist, and I ached to be a chemist. I, I was desperate to be a biochemist. I really wanted to do science. I, I ached to do science. And the MRC had these research grants, so by which you can get an MRC training fellowship and do an MSc, but to do a PhD. And I was... I was very great. Now, there's no question that before the MRC did that, the World Health Trust used to. There were, you know, I think it has just crowded out the private, the, public, the private sector. But one would hate a Jew. A Jew in the obscure world is a difficult world. And if you could, you could afford it with a social trust. So there's no, I don't know the answer to your question. I understand the question. I think it's a very legitimate question. But there is a social justice, and none of us really believe in social justice, except that we hate people being unhappy unnecessarily. So I don't know the answer to your question. You mean stealing money through the taxes? Yeah, yeah. basically. Well, the trouble... Another point with that is that in under uh, monetary fiscal policy, uh, you end up having credit expansion, which leads into student tuition fees. And, you know, the Fed expands credit all of a sudden more to like $30,000 a year. We do the same with houses, so then any kind of debt, you know, easy credit, you know, will just charge whatever they can afford to pay on the interest over. 
I mean, that's another problem with this. Everything you said is absolutely valid. There's no question that what you say is right. Um, there's no question what you say is right. The only problem is that people do feel the social justice argument very acutely. I mean, it's just one to get over politically, but I mean, if you're going for that, practical and Yeah, I agree with you, actually, basically. Okay. Yeah. But I'd be careful, in my job, I mean, I'd be careful <laughs> publicly. I mean, I believe that Buckingham should be an independent university. I mean, but um, it would be difficult for me in my job, not because I'm a dishonest man, but um, to say that all universities should be funded only by those who can afford the fees. Yeah, I mean, I worked, I worked to go through a whole week of global warming activism. So, <laughs> 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 but within limits. We don't, we don't believe in censorship. It's just that we, yeah, we do live in a society, that's all. Yeah. That's all. And there are social, societal norms. I mean, <laughs> I would have been very loath to really come out as an atheist 500 years ago. Not so much because I was worried about Luther chopping my head off, but because it would be so offensive. So it's more, it's more a matter of good manners. I think, I, think, I think what I'm trying to say is good manners, which is a subtle and a, and, a, and a slightly easy way of getting out of things. But good manners dictate that you subscribe to certain beliefs. And good manners are a form of game theory, really, which we all understand each other. So I think what I'm saying is good manners demand that you wouldn't want someone to be deprived of a place in education if the private sector somehow failed them and the government had the money. I think that's what I'm saying. It's a weak argument, and I know it. Because <laughs> I may not really fully believe it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely right. Before Remember this, all British universities were independent before 1914. And they only, they only took government money systematically. I mean, they obviously took government grants and things. But they only took uh, the UGC, now the HEFC, uh, because in 1919 the British universities were bankrupt. And, and it wasn't their fault, they didn't ask to go bankrupt. They went bankrupt because between, often people, forgot that, people often forget this, between 1815 and 1914, which is a hundred year time, the value of the pound went up. We had deflation for a hundred years. And so everyone invested in fixed interest vehicles like consoles, which paid 3%, because there was no inflation, but that was a real 3%. And everyone had fixed interest. And then suddenly between 1914 and 1918, huge inflation for obvious reasons, and the pound in 1918 is only worth a quarter of what it was in 1914. But everyone still invested in fixed vehicles. And so the universities just lost all their endowment income. Everyone thinks that Harvard invented the concept of endowment income. British universities had a huge endowment income before 1914, especially Oxford and Cambridge. And it just evaporated. By 1919, further inflation had continued to erode. The other huge source of income for the universities, of course, before 1914, was fees. But there were no fees. Only boys used to, only boys used to go to universities in any significant number in those days. Only middle-class boys, and they were all on the Western Front being shot. And so the universities lost their free income and lost their endowment income. And they were literally trading insolvently. Universities tell all sorts of lies about how poor they are. But in 1919, they were genuinely bankrupt. It wasn't untrue, it was genuine. And so they went to the government and they said, unless you give us money, there will be no universities in Britain in 1920. And that included Oxford and Cambridge. And so the government had to give them money. But before then, they had extremely elaborate bursary programs, there were county scholarships, there was a whole raft of voluntary mechanisms from voluntary associations, as well as statutory organizations like county councils to ensure that poor people were not deprived. And when people like Thomas Hardy wrote novels like Jude the Obscure, thousands of people said, oh my God, that's terrible, and wrote a check to Christchurch so that that wouldn't... And so the answer to your question is yes, it worked very well. And there was no... What's interesting is there was no social clamour in England before 1914 for poor people to go to university, because that need was being met. Complicated, of course, because universities in those days demanded Latin and stuff, and the state schools didn't necessarily teach it. But there was no constituency of people being deprived of place at university for lack of money. H.G. Wells, classic example, very, very poor. I mean, his mother was a housekeeper in a country estate in Sussex or something, but he went to Imperial College. Isn't one of the reasons why um, lots of people want to go to Oxford and Cambridge and so on that they're very selective um, academically? You've got in, so... <laughs> so... Um, Select um, academically so that they could charge people lots of money because lots of people would want to come because of good results. 
So, so what, what did you say? Sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm agreeing with you that um, universities would uh, take on poor people who couldn't afford them. Yeah, because it's in their interest. They want intelligent people to teach, not thick, of course. Although, don't forget, America has this huge concept of legacy places. I mean, how did George W. Bush, whom we know is not over endowed intellectually, how did he actually get to Yale, legacy place? His grandfather had left such a huge endowment, and they used to have these things at Oxford and Cambridge as well. You, know, you could only get fellowships at Christchurch if your grandfather you know, had left a particular endowment. And that's how George W. Bush got to Yale. But, of course, what Yale does to justify that legacy place is that for every George W. Bush they have to put up with, they have 20 poor but, but fantastic students, and so it's a sort of trade-off that takes place. I mean, the other thing about Oxford and Cambridge uh, and the top universities is um, what is the real purpose of university? There are two big economic theories. There is the economic theory of human capital. The idea is you come in as unformed, ignorant people, and after three or four years of exposure to the dons of Christchurch, you emerge your brains brimming with intellect and knowledge and fact. That's the human capital theory. But there is another theory, actually, which is called the credentialism theory. And what the credentialism says, actually, you don't learn anything at university, you just drink rather a lot. But what it is, it's very difficult to get to university, and also while you're here, people who observe what you're doing. So when future employers need to employ you, they know that if you've got to Oxford and you have a good reference from your tutor, they've got a bright cookie there, and so you've Oxford has done a very useful service to society of providing credentials to the economy. And it's very hard, actually, the more you look at what goes on at universities, to try to work out which is the real economic purpose of universities, how much is intellectual capital and how much is credentialism. But Oxford gives you a very nice credential. I think it gives a good credential because if you've been to Oxford, By the way, you're something to, you know, Ethan's a very interesting example. Ethan had a reputation of thick kids 30 years ago and didn't like it. And Ethan has consciously remolded itself as a school for very, very intelligent children who get the top A level grades. And I have lots of friends whose children, you know, who went to Ethan and who, to their horror, Ethan isn't taking their children. And they're, they're mortified by this. But Ethan has reinvented itself as an academically elite school. And is finding the money to pay for people who can't afford to go, by the way. And it illustrates the point very well how the market actually adjusts for the ultimate currency. And for a school like Eaton, the ultimate currency isn't money. Money is too a penny for Eaton. The ultimate currency is intellectual cachet. And the reinvention of Eaton. When I was at school, Eaton was, a, it was an institution that we all slightly felt sorry for because it was a, you know, when I was at school, it was Winchester that people looked up to. But that's, it's amazing how that's changed. So, it confirms your point very well. Um, how does, uh, so to clarify, how does one make money from science without patents? It's very simple. It's a good question. It's very simple. Imagine a world in which you had a number of competing companies in computers, say, making discoveries all the time. And you're the one company that said, 
we're not going to make discoveries, we're just going to sell 20 old computers, well, you would go out of business. So you've got to constantly develop better products just to keep up with the competition. So you could argue in a cynical way, well, we're not going to make any discoveries, we're just going to copy. But then everyone knows that you're always the company that's 18 months behind everybody else, so no one's going to buy your product. It'll be cheaper, but actually the thing about computers is that people don't want the cheap product, they want the best product, and so you go out of business. So you only, sorry, I'm upset. So you only make money in computers by being the company that has the new product that has, is better than other people. And you accept that within 18 months, people can copy the second mover advantage. But by then, no one's interested in the second mover. They want the new first mover advantage. Now, in much more slower moving industries, you could argue that that model wouldn't apply. Um, but then, if that's the case, why do you need to do R&D anyway? The only exception is pharmaceuticals. The cost of copying a drug compared to the cost of manufacture are tiny. Because um, the vast bulk of the cost of a new drug are regulatory costs. So it's very easy to show, because it just happens to be true, that you can develop new drugs for a few million pounds, which is neither here nor there. But once you make your discovery, you can spend up to a billion dollars on regulation. You have to show it's safe, and, and rightly so, you could argue. The result is that once you finish that process, it would, a competitor could copy you for only a few million dollars. Well, that's not fair. But it's not fair because it's the government that created the regulation. So even a libertarian, a libertarian can accept patents in the pharmaceutical industry because it's government regulation, which not all libertarians accept, but many libertarians accept there are some areas where government regulation is permissible. One of them is drugs, I can see you don't. But one of them is drugs. And if you accept that government regulation is legitimate in drugs, then you can accept government patents. And by the way, the empirical evidence is good. The tighter the patent laws of the pharmaceutical industry in a, company, in a country, the more R&D you have. I.e. the one area where patents have been shown to stimulate R&D is the pharmaceutical industry. But that's because patent rights are so tight. Right, so if, uh, the, if they pass any regulations, then would there be need for patents? Or would no. Libertarians always argue that. That uh, I have a friend called Daniel Klein in California who's always arguing that we don't need the FDA for this reason. But you've only got to look at the behaviour of distillers, who are the company who made thalidomide, and you've only got to look at the behaviour of other companies, even quite recently over recent drug scandals, to realise that companies do not always behave rationally when it comes to the protection of reputation. And there are companies who are surprisingly oblivious to the pain and distress that compounds cause because the profits continue to roll in. So I think drug companies have a terrible reputation, actually. It, and I, I, it may be earned, actually. <laughs> nasty people run drug companies, it seems, and do nasty things. So you could argue that if there had been no regulation at all in the first place, then there would be a different philosophy and different culture. But the, the history of the drug industry, I mean, Welcome, the Welcome Trust, he was a swine. I mean, he, made, he left all his money in the Welcome Trust, but he sold, just basically, he sold magic potions all his life. Um, I don't know, I, I am a libertarian, I really am a libertarian, uh, because I'm a Buckingham, which is a tough place to be. But I also know that, the, I mean, the, the pharmaceutical industry is an olig oligopoly, there are very few players. They all have monopoly power, really, and they all behave very badly. So I don't know what I can mean, really. <laughs> <laughs> about the pharmaceutical industry, only the pharmaceutical industry. Because it's about people dying, you know. Talk to you just as a point, we, we, uh, when you mentioned the Lindemann, we had uh, David Friedman speak uh, a few times ago. He's a great guy. He's exactly that example. And he said, if you were an FDA regulator, are you seriously going to, you know, rationally weigh the balances, weigh the balance, probabilities of, you know, Unseen, a massive unseen, you know, political cost to, to regulation. 
Yes, but that's about to go because um, technology is coming to our rescue because there's this whole new science, very exciting science, of personalized medicine. I don't know if you've heard about this, but what happens is that if you have a drug, here's a drug, and actually 99% of people, it really works very well. But every now and then there's someone who dies, and that means you can't sell the drug. But if you could work out genetically who can't take the drug, so that, that 1% of people don't take the drug, then the other 99% can take the drug, and moreover, they can take it at a much higher dose than you would otherwise have, because you're not... And so, the technology may come to our rescue on this one. And um, the, therefore, the regulatory and health and safety needs may actually be hugely reduced, because one of the real problems is the very large numbers of people you have to test on to catch the odd person who's going to die. And ultimately, it comes to... I mean, I, I have no doubt at all that just as we knew in the scandals of the car manufacturing industry of the 80s that, and 70s that the car companies were making a very rational calculation of if they made a, a Ford Edsel, whatever it was called, the one that they knew would kill people, they worked out how much are we going to be sued and how much would it cost to remodel the car and relaunch it and they reckoned we'll lose 30 lives a year, we'll lose that much in... in, in, in uh, court costs, we'll, we'll put the Edsel on the road. And when that calculation came out, I'm talking anecdotally now, I and mean, maybe I got the facts wrong, but I think what happened was when the, when the calculation came out, the first court case was so determined that that calculation would not persist that they charged something like $900 million, in, and, and so they changed the equation. And I don't think one should ever underestimate the self-centeredness of companies, actually. I used to be naive about companies. Um, I, I've become much more cynical about them. They are about making money. You, you have to put a cost in your life. I mean, that's what I do for a job. Is you, you need time to, because otherwise, you know, you build your whole plan out of titanium and then it's like, you know, you know, so you need a decent amount of price or a amount of price. Yeah, yeah, you're quite right. But <laughs> the company will get away with a lower price, and I think we should raise the price for companies. <laughs> but of course, you have to put a price on life. Of course, you're right. I don't know the detail about that case, but it sounds fortunate if they knew it was risky and they didn't say it was risky when they sold it. Of course it's fraudulent. Then, I mean, and that's, that, that's, a, that's a law that already exists. <laughs> it would be, yeah, but they're all cars are risky, aren't they? And they, and they, 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 and they, and they, and they know that they all have different degrees of risk, don't they? I just want to make a comment. Um, you, you told us three times tonight that you're a libertarian, and it reminds me of Margaret Thatcher, whom I'll paraphrase. She said, something a bit like this, that um, being a libertarian is a bit like being a lady if you have to tell people that you're not. <laughs> well, let me tell you what I think. I think that there should, instead of 40% of GDP go in taxes, I think it should be 10%. I would have the health service largely on the Swiss or German or French model as basically private insurance, just under, underwritten by the state for poor people and people needing heart transplants. I would have education revert to a pre-1891 situation that's basically left to the market. I'd have the universities left to the market. Uh, welfare, I'd go back to friendly societies. I, I mean, I really am a libertarian. It's just that there are... We also live in a society, uh, uh, an oak Oakshotian society, and the dinner, when we had dinner, um, I was so startled by the extreme libertarianism of the person behind you, that it forced me to say that I wasn't a libertarian to the extent that he was a libertarian, <laughs> where he would allow all six million people on the globe to die if property rights <laughs> had to be protected. I mean, you... you well, I'm not sure about that. Well, how many millions? How many millions? <laughs> we were talking about it, right. The point is, you really, I mean, you, you really are libertarian to an extent that I, I, I believe... I believe in very low taxes and a minimal state, but you believe in property rights and nothing else, as far well as I can work out. No, I mean, as a means to an end, but I think that's important means, yeah. Yeah. I mean, property rights, of course, but... I mean, we... One, we had a very interesting conversation, about, and it came out of Iraq, but one thing that was interesting was that he didn't believe me when I told him this, but no one owns land in this country, and no one owns land in America. You're nodding, so you know it's true. It wasn't the Queen who owned 
The, we, but nobody else owns that. Nobody owns the land. It's the same in America. I couldn't persuade him of this. You know, no country... Actually, in his defence, he did agree with you. All right. <laughs> He's a nice boy. I like him very much. I was enjoying the argument. But the point is, we, we, one of the things that people don't get right about property rights, and, and, and you were trying to argue, we had a lovely dinner, by the way, if I'm bullying you, I, yeah. one of the things I was trying to get at you is that property rights are not the sacred, uh, because actually, no, no nation, it's not just about the law, no nation allows people to claim the land as their own, because it, in all nations, it's always the sovereign who owns the land. In America, it's Washington, or the state government, that owns the land. In this country, the crown owns all the land. And freehold is simply the crown respecting your rights to that land until such time as she changes her mind, which is why the government has the right in law to put a road over your land and give you compulsory purchase in this country and eminent domain, we call it in America. And because and, and, he was arguing as a libertarian that if you have a thousand people who live there and a thousand people who live there, and they absolutely need a road between them, and there's a little man in the middle who owns a piece of land, a keep nut like going through a canyon, and he's not going to sell his land, he argues, fine, he doesn't have to sell his land, even though the thousand people there are going to die of starvation, and the thousand people there are going to die of thirst, because the water, you know, because the, the, the sacredness of the property rights overrules. And then I pointed out to him, and we had a lovely argument, that actually these property rights are simply are the gift of the Queen, and she could just take them away tomorrow. <laughs> but I think there's a reason why the Queen owns the land, because otherwise you end up in your ridiculous. Sorry? She has more guns than No! It's because. It's because property rights, although important, are only a means to a, a greater end. And I, and I think the libertarians who are. And there are libertarians for whom property rights are the sort of beginning of everything because they, they build an entire philosophy based on property rights. So if you tell an untruth, then you're. You know. But actually, property rights are a social convention, and no nation would ever allow individual property rights to overrule the needs of the collective. And nor would I. <laughs> so to that extent, I'm not a libertarian. <laughs> are we done now? <laughs> It's great, pleasure, I love it. It's a fun read, by the way. <laughs>